Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and this is my lecture entitled 50 Years of Music Synthesis. Part one looked at analog synthesis, part two looked at digital synthesis, and part three looked at digital sampling. Part two ended on a sour note for most American synthesizer manufacturers. Over a period of about three years, several American synthesizer manufacturers that had gotten started in either literal or spiritual Silicon Valley garages closed up shop. Bob Moog lost the rights to make instruments under his own name and had to make instruments under the name Big Briar. Tom Oberheim lost the rights to make instruments under his own name and had to make instruments under the name Marion Systems. Dave Smith went to work for Yamaha and later Korg. After that, he was able to make instruments under his own name as Dave Smith Instruments, but he wasn't able to use the name Sequential Circuits until recently. And it may seem unbelievable now if you look at prices on eBay, but in the mid to late 80s, a lot of these analog instruments that we've been talking about could be picked up in pawn shops and garage sales for basically nothing. Everybody wanted the newfangled digital synthesizers. I've heard stories about universities throwing out entire Buchla 100 and 200 series modular systems. Those are stories. I don't know if that's actually true or not. I hope it's not. But something interesting happened. A lot of folks who couldn't afford the newfangled digital synthesizers were able to buy some of these old analog synthesizers very cheap and start making music with them, creating whole new genres in the process. And then the demand for some of these old synthesizers went up, and the prices of them went up accordingly, and some manufacturers took notice. One of them was Gibson, who produced this instrument, the Oberheim OBMX. It's occasionally been nicknamed the Buchleheim because it was designed by Don Buchla and Lynx Crow, and Tom Oberheim himself had nothing to do with it. He had sold off the rights to the Oberheim name to Gibson, and again, then Tom was unable to make instruments under his own name. The Oberheim was one of a new wave of instruments that used analog sound generating circuitry, but of course controlled by microprocessors via digital to analog converters. Eventually, Bob Moog did get the rights to his name back, and Moog Music was back, and they've basically been reissuing variations of the Mini Moog for the past 200 years or so. And to be clear, I'm not complaining, because the underlying structure of the Mini Moog is just an amazing sounding synth. And many of the newer versions continue this trend of adding modern computer control to this analog sound. Not everything was a reboot of an older instrument. You had new computer-controlled analog synths coming out, like the Alesis Andromeda 6. And digital signal processing hardware had caught up to the point where you could legitimately simulate some of these analog circuits in real time in software, leading to instruments like the Nordlead and the Axis Virus. And since this was now a piece of software, you could implement it in different ways. You could buy a box that had a digital signal processing chip running the algorithm. You could buy a separate box for your computer that had a bunch of DSPs in it and the box would sit in a rack. Or you might have some plug-in cards for your computer that included digital signal processing chips to run the algorithm. Let's check out a demo of the Access Virus. Nowadays, you take it for granted that you can record, playback, and edit audio on a computer, but if you go back to the early 90s, these required expensive pieces of add-on hardware. My first experience with this was actually before Pro Tools with DigiDesign's audio media card, and later I had a DigiDesign sound tool system that I was able to get as a discount because it was a display unit in a store that they were getting rid of. But it was still several thousand dollars, and it was just two-track record, playback, and editing. The only plugins I really have are Waves plugins because I've kept those somewhat up to date. Because I started with Waves back when you had to have an ADB Apple Desktop Bus dongle plugged into your machine for the license, and you could only preview the effects on a couple of seconds of a loop. 
you couldn't really play back the whole file with the effect in real time. You had to run that effect offline. Of course, as computing technology improved, you eventually got to the point where you could actually run these programs on your regular CPU on your computer and not need some sort of DSP chip add-on. Now let's check out a demo of the Arturia CS80V. That's fun because that's someone trying to sound like Vangelis without actually copying a piece of Vangelis music. Back in 2006, when I ran the first version of this class, I thought to myself, wow, these vintage synths have really gone up in price since I last looked at them. But that's nothing compared to what they are today, if you want something like, say, an ARP 2600. Let me play for you an example from one of the emulated 2600s, once again from Arturia. I don't know what's going on there, but it sounds cool. Remember the 2600 had a normal patching scheme, so if you didn't plug any cables into it, it would still make a sound, pre-routed with one of the most standard configurations someone might want. But if you wanted to do something fancier like what we just heard, you could plug in the cables and the act of plugging in the cable would disconnect that default connection. Now let's listen to some comparisons between a real ARP 2600 and an emulated 2600. I should talk a bit more about exactly what we're going to be hearing. The PWM here refers to pulse width modulation. The idea here is that if you consider your standard square wave, that's going to have only odd harmonics. That creates a hollow sound that you will hear a lot in bass sounds used in acid house music. And it's also the base of a start of a sound, something like a clarinet. Now we can change the pulse width so that we have, say, just a very narrow pulse. And that will not only give you even harmonics in addition to odd harmonics, but it will also tend to spread them out. If you actually run this to its limit, you wind up with all of the harmonics at equal amplitude. And this is the basis of something like a harpsichord sound. A common trick to give some animation to a square wave sound is to make slow, subtle variations in the duty cycle. Now, you can get really crazy sounds if you take that variation the duty cycle and make that variation itself run at an audio rate. Let's listen to what that sounds like. I think that's enough of that. You get the idea. That's something that's fairly difficult to replicate properly in digital signal processing. Let's hear how it sounds. I'll leave it to you to rewind and compare in more detail if you want. So the next example also needs a bit of explanation. Here what we're going to do is we're going to take the standard low-pass filter, which is a part of every classic analog subtractive synthesis chain. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the cutoff frequency of the filter and we're going to sweep that up and down. So you could have a low cutoff or you could have a high cutoff or you could have a medium cutoff. And as we'll see later in the course, you can also have cases where there's a bit of a bump in the frequency response right before the cutoff. This is usually called something like Q or resonance or emphasis. Changing this cutoff frequency is what gives you that classic wow kind of synthesizer sound. Now, I could vary the cutoff with a low frequency oscillator and it would sound something like wow, 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 wow. But what if I were to change the cutoff using a control voltage that itself was running at an audio rate. And that, my friends, is a recipe for sonic chaos. It sounds a bit like an amplitude modulation, aka ring modulation effect, but it really is its own thing. And I honestly would have no idea how to start trying to come up with any closed form expressions for the resulting spectra. Anyway, here we go.
Okay, that was the original actual true ARP. Let's try the simulation. Again, I'll leave it to you to go back and listen to those examples again to compare them if you want. In any case, whether it matches the original ARP exactly or not, I think is a bit beside the point. I think it sounds good in its own right. So once you start trying to create virtual instruments that run on a laptop that model old famous synthesizers, of course, you're going to do that for every famous synthesizer you can think of, particularly something like the Minimoog. Now, in this case, unlike with the Axis virus I showed you earlier, this box here doesn't actually have the sound generating circuitry in it. It doesn't have any DSP in it. This is just a controller for controlling the parameters of the synth that's actually running on either your laptop or for the DSP chips that are on a plug-in card for your computer or something that's just flat out running on the CPU on your computer. Here, once again, we have a controller, in this case designed for the Prophet 5 voice architecture, that can drive things like software running on a DSP card. If you look at the DSP card in the slide, you'll notice it matches the DSP card in this slide. It's just a general DSP running various programs. And here's an example of Native Instruments version of the Prophet 5 that runs natively on the CPU on your laptop. A lot of those synth demos kind of start to sound the same after a while. Here's another one. Here we have the Arturia Moog Modular where you can actually move different modules around on your screen and connect them with patch cords that when you move them from one point to another sort of swing a bit with patch cord physics. And yep, that's very Moog modulary. So far, I've talked about DSP algorithms that emulate analog synthesizers, but you can have algorithms running on your laptop that emulate hardware digital synthesizers. And that should be a very natural thing to do because whether this algorithm is being implemented on some sort of custom digital chip in a DX7 or it's being run by your more general CPU, it's just crunching numbers. So it shouldn't surprise you that you can write a piece of software and now, given very fast computers, run it in real time that emulate some sort of digital hardware that's external to your computer. We looked at plugins that played samples in the last part of this lecture. I mention it again here because these pieces of software, like a lot of their 80s hardware counterparts, have various kinds of processing like filters that you can apply to those underlying samples. And of course, the beauty of the flexibility of your desktop or laptop computer is that it's fairly general. So you don't necessarily need to copy old synthesizers, either analog or digital. You are free to come up with entirely new constructions. And in particular, you don't need to make the interface look like one of those old synthesizers with knobs and sliders and switches. You can have your interface be all kinds of weird whatevers. What I'm showing here is a much earlier version of the Chameleon synthesizer, back when it was produced by a company called Camel Audio. I think Camel Audio got bought by Apple. Chameleon is based on additive synthesis, kind of like the digital keyboard synergy that we looked at in part two, but it makes this additive synthesis easier in that it will analyze existing sounds, create an additive synthesis structure for you, and then you can mix and match that and modify that in different interesting ways. Let's listen to a demo of that. Spooky. That's spooky. Now, if you are not taking ECE 4450 analog circuits for music synthesis with me in the spring 2021 semester, you can check out here and move on to part five of this lecture.
But if you are taking this class with me in the spring 2021 semester, I have a little task for you. So I would like you to go to your web browser and go to www.arturia.com. Arturia makes some really amazing software synthesizers. And in particular, they have a very generous demo policy. Basically, you can download one of their programs and it will work for 15 minutes and then it will stop making sound, but you can quit the program and restart it, which will be enough for this assignment. I would like you to go to software instruments and look at the vast variety of instruments they have here. I would like you to download the demos for one of these instruments and then modify one of the patches. So the patches are one of the preset sounds that come with the software. Then take a screenshot of that and upload it to an assignment spot on Canvas that I'll set up for you. So in terms of what instrument to pick, pick something that looks synthesizer-y and shy away from ones that are sample-based. So for instance, don't pick the Emulator 2 because that's a sampler. Don't pick something like one of the electric piano or one of the classic electronic organ emulations. Stay away from the DX7. That's not very analog. Stay away from the CZ, which is phase distortion, which isn't very analog. Stay away from the CMI, that's sample-based. Stay away from the clavinet. Let's see what else we have here. Stay away from the organ and piano type of things. For the purposes of this assignment, let's stay away from the Selena. That's a string machine. It's kind of like, it's kind of a synthesizer, but it's closer to an electronic organ in its architecture. Stay away from the B3, because that's an organ. Stay away from the Synclavier because that's digital. How about pick June 6, OBXA, Jupe 8. Those are all nice analog-y things. Uh, Synthy is good. Buchla Music Easel is good and mind-bending. ARP 2600 is good. CS80, Mini V, Modular V, SAM, all excellent. Profit VS, I'll say yes on that one. The oscillators are digital, but the core processing chain is very analog-y. Matrix 12 is both excellent and a beast, so that would be a good one to experiment with. Anyway, pick one of those, download it. You can install a standalone version of it that's not a plugin for something like Cubase or Logic or Pro Tools and run that standalone app. And the standalone app will have a little graphical keyboard that you can click with your mouse to make notes and try the different patches, listen to some of the built-in sounds, change one of those, and then screenshot that. And that's basically just a way of making sure you've done this assignment. I just want you to experiment and have fun. Normally, I would have you come in and make a video of yourself actually using a Korg MS-20 or spending some time on our MOTM modular system. But with COVID-19, I don't want to do anything that encourages you to come into campus.